turn this over to you in just a second, Chris. Uh, we're going to be talking about seven costly mistakes families make in their estate plans. Uh, we're delighted that you've joined us today. And uh, uh, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, using Zoom, it seems like it's having a lot of different effects. So it looks like to us as, uh, as we and, and uh, our clients become more familiar with Zoom, it's going to give us a chance to have uh, meetings uh, for, for people who are, have trouble negotiating the traffic or getting to our office. This may offer an additional opportunity uh, for coordination and appointments without actually having come to the office. Also, we can now uh, do uh, notarization and witnessing uh, by video conferencing. So I think this is going to be useful uh, to some of our families that are not near uh, our Houston office. So at any rate, uh, it's, a, it's a time of change. Uh, the information we're going to give to you, I hope you'll find it great. And we're going to start off here with uh, Chris. Uh, Chris is my partner. Uh, the, the, the Bond Law Firm is now the Bond and Brown Law Firm. And so this is part of the idea that we want the law firm to continue on into the misty future to help uh, all of our families. So uh, Chris, take it from there. Thank you. And a couple of other housekeeping items is if you're seeing uh, multiple participants on your screen right now, you can minimize that. So on the box that Bob and I are showing up on right now, there's some options at the top. It says hide thumbnail video, show small active speaker video, and then there's the one that we're on right now. So you click on the middle one, should be able to drop it so that it's just Bob and I showing. Uh, if you have any trouble with that or have any questions, just type it in the uh, chat or the question and answer segment. And about question and answer, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, just type them in there and we'll try to address as many of those as we can at the end. But if it's a technical issue, uh, Mary can help you with that as we proceed onward. All right, having gotten that out of the way, I just want to say thank you for joining today. I know this has been a very different time in America right now. So what we're going to talk about today are the seven costly mistakes families make with their estate planning. And we're also going to talk about why most estate plans fail and what you can do about it. So there's no question that these are perilous times in America, probably more so than any other time we've given this presentation. And no group is more affected than seniors, uh, retirees, and the elderly. And then you can only imagine, you know, into the future, what sort of issues your children are going to be facing. I'm sure none of us imagined that we were going to be facing some sort of national shutdown from a virus. You know, I'm not, we're not going to try to scare you and say that that's a reason for getting your estate planning done because you might get the virus. What we want to talk to you about is, you know, this is a great example for a lot of people are realizing that things can go sideways quick. And so, you know, wishful thinking and procrastination are extremely dangerous. And we'll talk more about that. But uh, So lots of reasons why these are perilous times in America. The first is America has one of the highest divorce rates in the developed nations in the world. It's, that's no secret. And as a result, there are more and more blended families out there. And a blended family is one in absolute need of good estate planning. Things can go haywire real quick with a blended family. Additionally, there's more and more people, uh, more and more of a percentage of the population are having to go to nursing home or other long-term care in their elderly years. And that's expensive, that's extremely expensive. So the average cost of a nursing home in the Houston area is around $63,000 per year. You can just imagine how $63,000 a year can destroy a nest egg pretty quickly. And because of those high costs, more than half of all bankruptcies are caused by crushing medical bills. And I've actually seen this. I worked with a bankruptcy trustee uh, here in Houston, 
And I've seen, sit in these meetings and just seen how the families are just destroyed, but they didn't have any other option. They had to take care of themselves. And so this is a huge issue facing many Americans. And then we've got poor estate planning. So there's, people are just willing to sue at the drop of a dime. That's just the way this country is you know, developed. But with estate planning, there's so many places you can find a will or a trust even, your, your power of attorney documents, all free online. Well, I tell you what, that is a big cause for a lot of these lawsuits because they do not, uh, they're not properly drafted and they don't include the right provisions. And so our clients that come in typically have six major concerns, and that's what we're going to focus on here. So the first of those concerns is that they want limited government involvement. In fact, no government would be fantastic. People typically don't want the government getting their nose involved in their personal affairs, and that's with good reason. On that same note, of course, people don't want to pay more taxes or fees than they need to. You, you worked hard for this money and you want to leave it to your children or your, or your beneficiaries uh, as much of it as possible. Third, and we talked briefly on this, is uh, nursing home costs. No one wants to go to a nursing home, of course, but certainly nobody wants to go bankrupt in the process. So we're going to talk about how you can avoid that. Uh, they want to avoid creditors and predators taking advantage of their spouse or their beneficiaries. They also want the family to come together at their time of death. This is a big one because so often a death can really tear a family apart and that's just the opposite of what you want to have happen. So with proper planning in place, we can help mitigate that risk and hopefully bring the family together upon your passing or disability. The last thing is a lot of law firms and people, when they think of estate planning, only think of the money. Well, there's so much more to that we're all so much more than just the assets that we collect over our lifetime. More importantly, we are the sum of our stories and uh, memories and really the legacy that we're leaving behind. So we wanna provide a holistic way of the family really being able to pass down more than just their money. And so now you know the six major concerns and my job here today is gonna to be to tell you uh, Bob and I, I'm sorry, are, is to tell you how you can avoid each of these concerns, but is knowing enough? Well, let's put it another way. How many people out there have ever tried to lose a few pounds? I know I have. And so what do you know that you have to do to lose some weight? Pretty simple, really. You got to work out more, so burn some more calories and you got to eat less or eat more healthily. And so those two things together help you lose weight. But how much weight has anybody ever lost just by knowing those two things? None. It's about taking action, really making a commitment to take action and then following through with that. And so one of our real focuses here today is going to get you to, yeah, excuse me, is getting you to take action, to quit procrastinating and really make a change for the better for you and for your family. So let me introduce myself real quickly. Uh, I've been with a law firm uh, for a number of years now, or over a year, and I graduated from the University of Houston Law Center here in Houston. Now after law school, and before working with the Bond Law Firm, I was an asset manager for a large, private, limited family partnership. And that was a great job, and I learned a lot that's applicable to my role here as an estate planning attorney, but it, it lacked one thing that I really was craving, and that's working with people on a daily basis. One thing to work with assets, but being able to work with people and, and help families is really a blessing. I, I am grateful every day for that opportunity. Now, before I got into the law and going to law school, I worked at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics up in Fort Worth, Texas. It was a great job. I was working on the F-16 program. I mean, those are just amazing machines. 
In fact, there's a Blue Angels flyover over Houston today. I never you know missed it. Uh, we might have. But uh, anybody who's gotten to see a jet fighter up close knows it's just awe inspiring. That was a great job, but really, I wanted to get my family closer to Houston and uh, also push myself further. So that's why I decided to move on to the law. Now, before Lockheed, I got my business degree from Texas Christian University uh, with a double major in finance and supply chain management. Uh, go Frogs, I'm just a, I bleed purple. <laughs> and uh, more importantly than any of those things is, so I had the good fortune of meeting my wife when I was in high school. Uh, we've actually been together consistently since we were sophomores in high school, and I couldn't feel more blessed about that. And the reason I, I bring all this up is family is extremely important to me. I know it's extremely important to Bob. And so my wife and I, we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, we have a son who turns nine years old this month. And I think he's just the coolest guy there is. He really is a lot of fun. And so here's a picture of them. And uh, really that's what I care most about is in that picture right there. And I know that's probably what you care most about. And that's the whole reason we're having this discussion today is taking care of our family. Bob, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, thank you. So uh, just uh, uh, to refresh your memory, I'm, I'm um, a native Texan. I grew up in Dallas. I went to Southern Methodist University. And then when I, as soon as I finished my last exam at Southern Methodist, went home and looked in the mailbox and I had a draft notice. So the Army had plans for me for a few years. I went to officer candidate school. I was commissioned as an infantry officer. And although I never intended to get to make the army a career, I never got out. So I was in from 69 to 89. I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, a regular army infantry in 1989. I'd, I'd always said at some point, I think I'm going to go back to law school. And so the month after I finished, uh, uh, retired from the army, I started law school and I, we came back to Texas to San Antonio. And so it uh, takes three years to finish law school. So in 1992, I took a job with Arthur Anderson. This was before Arthur Anderson was killed off in the Enron scandal. Uh, at that time, they were the largest accounting firm in the United States. Uh, they had offices all over the United States and they had 1200 people in the Pennzoil building in downtown Houston. And they hired a few attorney CPAs for their tax department. And the reason I wanted to work for them is because you can't be a CPA unless you work for a CPA. But I had a master's degree in accounting and I'd pass a CPA exam and I couldn't stand the thought of not getting that designation. So that's why I went to work for Arthur Anderson. After two years, I decided to start the law firm. And as you may have heard me sell before, you know, when you start a law firm, you got to decide what you're going to do. So one thing you can do is you can defend criminals, but I don't like being around criminals and Criminals are mostly guilty, so it didn't seem like a very uh, uh, encouraging line of work for me. And then, then you can go into family law, and family law sounds kind of nice, but as you may know, family law is really divorce law. And divorcing people are unhappy people, and uh, they want their attorney to be unhappy with them. And this did not suit my sunnier disposition. So I decided that I would uh, go into the state planning, probate, wills, trusts, and related areas of the law. And so that was the focus as I started the uh, law firm. And of course, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been, the firm's more than 25 years old now. And our coach, our goal is to have it go on out into the decades in the, in the misty future, because we have thousands of clients in the Houston area. And I know that from time to time, that family is going to need to come back. They're going to need advice. They're going to need to do amendments. They're going to need to do restatements. Uh, people are going to become disabled and people are going to pass away. And another aspect of our work is that we work with uh, helping people qualify for Medicaid. And this is uh, for nursing home care. So this is, uh, to me, it seems like very important uh, functions. And although when I started, of course, I just I wanted a good business doing productive things. But um, over the years, we have had the opportunity to help thousands of Texas families protect their loved ones and their wealth. And I know that the team here doesn't see that there's any other better work than what we're doing, this chance to help people protect their families. And so we, we want to help you and your family as well. Now, I'm not sure which slide. I think I jumped ahead here. Yeah, you can. Uh, 
Uh, now, Chris pointed out the point of continuity in his life with his uh, sweet bride that he met in high school. Well, uh, the, the big point of continuity in my life is Jeannie, and Jeannie and I met in Yellowstone National Park, of all things, in the 60s. And uh, this May, we're going to be married for 51 years. And we have a, a daughter, Natalie, and she has uh, three little boys. And we have our son, Will, and he has four little children. And, and of course, we have a dog in our family that we love. And so uh, uh, taking care of families, thinking about families, that's what estate planning is about. That's the center of, of people's lives. And so we want to help your family as well. Now, um, one of the problems if you have a small business is that uh, you may not really stay up to date on things. You may, you know, get in the habit of doing things and not uh, really, really know uh, what's going on all over the, the country and what's going on, what's the latest thing in tax law or what the latest techniques are to help clients. And this has worried me. And so a number of years ago, I joined the American Academy of State Planning Attorneys. And this is an organization that, uh, that, that has about 150 estate planning law firms that are affiliated with it all across the country. And the purpose of the American Academy is to help their law firms adopt best practices and make available to us the best possible documents. They have nationally recognized experts on their staff. Uh, they stay on top of all the latest tax law issues, estate planning techniques, and any other thing that would affect our clients. And this means we have world-class documents. It means we have resources that are not available to uh, most uh, estate planning law firms. And it gives us confidence that when we work with you, we can give you the best possible uh, documents, the best possible advice uh, that you could get in the world of estate planning. So congratulations on, on spending this beautiful Chamber of Commerce afternoon with us. And what are we going to talk about? Oh, here we go. Death and taxes, nursing home expenses, families torn apart, and your plan may not work. So this is quite a, quite a, a selection of, of topics today. Now, Chris alluded to this. You say, you know, everybody knows they need to do estate planning, right? We need to get this stuff in order. So how come we don't? Well, we procrastinate. Well, why do we procrastinate? Well, uh, Stephen Covey in his book, you know, that Seven Habits of, of Highly Successful People, there's a whole series of those books. One of the things he said that's always stuck with me is that in our lives, there are four activities of life. And three of them are relatively easy, and the fourth one causes all the trouble. So one, one type of activity are things that are urgent and important. And if we're competent people, we take care of the stuff that's urgent and important, right? And then there's stuff that's that's not it's uh, it's urgent, but it's not important. And that's all the text messages and the phone calls and the emails that we feel like we've got to respond to, but in the great scheme of things, they're not very important. And then there's stuff that's not urgent and not important. And that's where we like to spend, you know, drinking coffee, shooting the bull, watching TV, and so forth. So, so those are all we got to do them, or they're fairly easy to do. And then there's one other area that causes all the trouble. And that's the stuff that's important, but not urgent. And estate planning is that in spades. And we just keep putting this stuff off. It's like a monster grabs a hold of these projects and won't let them go. Now, one of the reasons for this is that on these important projects that uh, are not urgent, we always feel like we've got to do some research. We've got to do some legwork. We got to do, give this some thought before we actually take action. And we say to ourselves, well, I don't have time to do that research this week. So uh, maybe next week. And it just goes off and off and off into the future. We don't come to grips with it. So one of our goals today is to bring you up to date and give you that feeling that you have an idea about the scope of this project. And now's the time to take care of it if, if, the, if there are important issues that you uh, need to address. Just one thing real quick. Uh, there was a study done by caring.com and the results match up with another survey done by AARP. They both showed that only 40% of Americans have estate planning. So that means 60% don't. 
of that 60% who don't, don't have estate planning, half of those are because they haven't gotten around to it, but they want to. So that's 30% of America is uh, in that boat where they've been meaning to do it, but they just haven't. They've been procrastinating. Well, and of course, the other part of it is that once we do our estate planning, it's hard to go back and make adjustments to it, even after we realize we need to do something. So there's a lot of different mode possibilities here for uh, uh, procrastination. I know the last time I did a uh, 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 review of my own estate planning and updated it, uh, I procrastinated a good while before, before I did it. But uh, it's like Chris was saying, in order to actually move these kinds of projects, we, we've got to bring them to the forefront and we've got to commit ourselves to action to make it happen. So let's talk about planning options that are available to people. So we got the no plan plan. We got the will having a will plan. We got the living trust planning and then we got the legacy wealth planning. And so no plan means you don't have any plan. And this will means that the person who has no plan has not, has not taken the effort to protect his, fam his spouse and his family from all the troubles and problems that are going to be caused simply by not having a plan. And also that person hasn't taken the time to think about his situation and their situation to build in protections that might be possible had he had that person done the planning. And then, uh, you know, a will is almost the idea I need to get my will done is almost synonymous with this whole, how do you get your estate planning in order? I need to get a will done. And so we, we, we uh, so for many people, they think, well, once I get the will, or if I do a will, then I've, I've taken care of it. The will only covers probate property. And so it needs a lot more understanding uh, and it needs other documents to go with it in order to make this uh, work. A will is only takes over when one passes away, but our other contingency is what if we're disabled? Now, uh, living trusts are, are, are fairly common. Uh, you can get them anywhere. You can get them on the internet. You can get them from annuity salesmen. They're all over the place. And uh, they vary a great deal in, in what the documents, uh, how they're written, what they are designed to deal with. And in most cases, for one reason or another, they won't work very well, either because they don't deal with the problems that your family is anticipating or because they're not properly funded. In other words, assets aren't actually owned by the trust. When we do planning, our legacy wealth planning, we always try to see the, the whole situation and help the client address those, their concerns. And then we want to set up a plan that we can expect will work the way the client wants it to work if it's called upon uh, and needed. So we're going to cover why traditional planning has failed most Americans, why most estate plans don't work, the benefits of our approach. We want you to identify what's most critical to you. And so one of the things that I would suggest is, as we're going through this, we're going to talk about a lot of different situations. Those that worry you or that you think are, are something you're interested in, jot those down. Because if you come in for a, a meeting with us, then we want to make sure that the things that are important to you are what we cover in your plan. Um, at the end, we're going to have a, a question and answers. And like, a, like Chris was saying before, you can write your uh, questions on the, uh, in the chat. And uh, Mary will monitor that and get it to us uh, towards the end of the session. So uh, this slide says, ready for an epiphany? You know what epiphany is? That's where somehow something happens and something that you've been thinking about or had considered previously suddenly takes on a renewed significance or it seems to have more depth of meaning. And so one of the things that we do with, uh, with things like our procrastination about estate planning or getting amendments done is we tend to try to make it routine. So rather than feeling all that pain of, golly, I ought to get this done, we say, you know, I know I need to update my will or I, I don't want to get into tax problems or tax issues because I didn't take care of this. Um, so what I want you to do is just think with me for a second. Just imagine that uh, today you finally decided to, to uh, get out of the house and, and take a needed trip to go to the, uh, the grocery store or to, the, or to uh, Lowe's to get some um, uh, household project going. 
And uh, on the way there, you make a left turn on a busy street and the 18 wheeler never saw the light come sailing through. And there's a tremendous impact and it is over for you. It's finished. Your plan, whatever it is, is activated. Is it set up to deal with your family situation? Have you thought about what you need to do that would provide protection for them if that's what they need? Or on the other side, to avoid trouble, problems, additional expense, time, and worry uh, with your estate planning. Okay, that's one of our contingencies. We get run over by that 18 wheeler at that intersection. The other one is, and that's our, our disability. So imagine for me, with me for a minute that, it, that uh, in, tonight, after you go to bed, you wake up and you have this blinding headache and flash. And then you don't remember anything. And then the next morning, uh, you open your eyes, it's light in the room, and someone comes into the room and you feel like you ought to know who they are, but you're not quite sure who it is. And then you hear them talking, but you can't really understand what it means. And when you try to move, one side of your body doesn't respond. This is the stroke scenario or the dementia scenario. And so disability or long-term disability at any rate is, is a uh, horrible to contemplate and it's a much more, typically much more difficult uh, state planning problem than if you just get run over by that 18 wheel. So let's, uh, let's think, let's make this more immediate so we can see the importance of addressing it and also uh, see what's important to us that we want to deal with. So in order to talk about this, uh, we're going to talk about Bill and Mary and their family. And this, and this poor couple is going to fall in every estate planning pothole. Now these potholes are out there. But one of your goals as in doing your estate planning is not to fall in all, all the potholes. So uh, Bill and Mary just retired, okay? They retired last week. And you know, when you retire, it's a brand new day. The old routine is off, it's a new routine. Everybody sets up goals. And uh, they're pretty happy about that. Bill, Bill was a surveyor. He worked uh, for a pipeline company for uh, many years. And then uh, he worked for a utility here in Texas. Uh, they have about $700,000 in their nest egg. They're, they have a house that's paid for. Uh, they've got, so, both of them have social security and a pension. And so they feel pretty good about where they are and they're looking forward to their, their retirement. They have a daughter, Susan. Susan was a cute little girl. She was the teacher's pet. She had nice friends. She made good grades. She ran with good company. She went to Baylor. Uh, she. Uh, majored in accounting. She got her CPA. She's married and she has two adorable little kids. And so Bill and Mary are very happy about how Susan's turned out. John, their son, raised in the same home, the same values, the same church services, the ch same everything. Uh, followed a different and less fortunate path. Uh, he got in trouble in, in uh, high school, kind of ran with the wrong crowd, experimented with alcohol went to college, uh, experimented with drugs and alcohol. Uh, he didn't, he almost finished, but didn't quite finish college. He said he's been married and divorced. He's had several uh, jobs. He has a hard time staying employed, it seems. And he's had a DWI and uh, uh, he has a casual attitude towards paying his taxes. So uh, his parents love him and he's got many great qualities and yet he doesn't seem to be able to get his feet under him. And they're very concerned about him. So that's the story. And um, so this says mistake planning uh, number one, no protection to pass hard earned wealth without government or court interference. And so we're talking about two different things. Uh, uh, living probate, guardianship, and that's what you have if you don't have decent setup. Um, and then we have death probate, and of course that's the probate process when someone uh, passes away. So uh, in, in uh, let me see what this next slide is. Um, so let me tell you the, the story. So Bill and Mary, he retired, 
Uh, one of the first things they had on their list, their to-do list, was to uh, get some exercise, have an exercise program. They wanted to get back in shape and uh, live more health uh, in a healthier way. Also on their list was to, to get a, a simple will done. And so right after he retired, they, uh, they started ex an exercise program. And not many days into that, uh, they were both on treadmill side by side. And, uh, and, and Bill suddenly got this, uh, got dizzy and collapsed on the, the uh, treadmill. They carried him to the hospital. It turned out he'd had a, had a stroke. He stayed overnight. They gave him some medicine. Uh, there were no residual effects. And, um, and so they breathed a huge sigh of relief, except Mary said, you know, maybe we ought to go ahead and get that will done. So they called up the, the real estate attorney who helped him a few years ago on a real estate issue and said, hey, can you do a simple will for us? And uh, the, attor the attorney said, well, I'm not a state planning attorney, but I can do a simple will. So they went down there and they got the simple will done. So the, the estate planning documents that they have are a simple will for Bill and a simple will for Mary. And a simple will means that if one of them dies, it leaves everything to the other one. And if both of them get run over, it leaves the property equally and outright to their kids. Okay, that's what the simple will means. Now, um, after after a few more months go by, and and uh, Bill had a massive stroke, and this time he's not coming home, and there are res there are serious residual effects. So he goes through a period of rehab, and then he comes home. Now the good news is he can get around, he can walk and so forth, or he doesn't walk very well. He, can, he can't talk right. You know, the family can kind of understand him, but uh, he swallows his words and, and uh, people that are not familiar with him can't understand uh, uh, what he says. His mental processes aren't quite right, but he's, uh, he's affable enough and Mary can take care of him at home. So she's not in a situation where they need nursing home costs. So what's the problem? Well, the, not very long into this, Mary, Mary realizes that she's going to be able, need to be able to access his, uh, his uh, uh, self-directed IRA. Well, his IRA has, an IRA only has one name on it. There's no other way to set it up. So Bill's IRA came out of his 401k at work and uh, he's the owner. But she's the primary beneficiary for 100%. So she realizes she needs to be in a position to take charge of that. So she calls up the financial institution that's the custodian for it and says, I need to take a distribution out of my husband's IRA. And they say, well, you need to put your husband on the phone. And she says, well, he, he can't come to the, he, he can come to the phone, but he, he can't talk well enough for you to understand what he's, he's saying. And uh, because he had a stroke. And the person on the other end of the phone says, well, have you got power of attorney? Well, no, they just have a simple will. Well, she can't access that IRA. If she wanted to sell the house or refinance the house, she can't do it. She doesn't have power. The will only takes over when he dies, not when he's disabled. So in that case, if she's going to access this, she's going to experience what we're calling a living probate. This means she's going to go to the probate court to establish a guardianship. So she's going to have to hire an attorney. She's going to have to hire a doctor. She's going to have to uh, disclose all the information about their family finances. The whole thing is time consuming. It's expensive. It's um, uh, humiliating in many ways. And so at the end of the day, then the judge will appoint her. It's up to the judge, but presumably the judge is going to appoint Mary as the, the guardian of her husband. And this will have, allow her access. But the story is not over there. Once she's appointed guardian, every year she's going to have to go back and provide an accounting of the money that came in and how it was used uh, to help her husband until he dies. So this is just the a mortal pain to get into a guardianship situation. And if she'd had better planning, this would have been unnecessary. This is a pitfall they didn't need to experience. Now, a, a few years pass and, and Bill passes away. Okay, remember they got a will. 
Now, here's another point where people get confused. Wills are typically initialed on every page. They are signed, they are witnessed, and they are notarized. They are a very official looking document. And many people believe that if they have a will with all of that going on, there's no reason why they'd have to go to court. It says in plain language that Mary is his executor when Bill dies. Why does she need to go to court? She just take that to the bank or take that to the title company. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, if you think that, that, you, that is incorrect. The will does not have any power until a judge, you go through the probate process, and a judge gives the executor what's called a letter, letters testamentary. This is a, a letter from the judge saying that, that uh, Mary is authorized to go round up the decedent's property. And so, so this is gonna cost money. It typically is gonna uh, cost uh, from uh, $3,500 to $7,000 in our office, and it's going to take six or eight weeks just to get the letter. So then she can go ahead and start rounding up the property and selling the home or whatever she was trying to do. Uh, she needs that letter before she can really get underway. So it's time consuming, it's open to the public. And if they have property in another state, if they had a condo in, Col in uh, Florida or a condo in, you know, or a timeshare someplace, you can get into a situation where there has to be an ancillary probate or another probate in the other state. This is way too much trouble if you've got property in multiple states. If they'd had better planning, this would have been unnecessary. And when somebody is disabled, there's lots of things to do. You don't need to kick yourself in the shins with some big project like having to go to the guardianship court on top of all this other stuff. And when someone passes away, there are lots of things that need to be done. But this going to the probate court is an additional hoop that the family doesn't necessarily have to jump through. Okay, mistake planning number two. Now, in, our, in, in Mary's case and Bill's case, they were lucky that he never went to the nursing home. She was able to take care of him at home until he passed away. But many families that we help, that is not the option. Mom or dad have gotten to the point where they can't be taken care of at home. The family can't take care of them. Uh, it's just not feasible. And so they need care in a nursing home. So that's where we get into this problem that nursing home costs are very expensive. Now I've had many clients that tell me, I'm not going to a nursing home, period. As if they were in, gonna be in control of it. Of course, the problem is at the stage where we go to nursing home, we probably don't have any control of the situation. So asserting that you're not going to the nursing home is actually no protection. It's just the kind of wishful thinking we do when we're trying not to address an issue. So. Let me tell you a story about uh, this, and we're going to talk about a different family, and we're going to talk about how you pay for this stuff. So there are five ways to pay for long-term care expenses. Use your own money, buy long-term care insurance, apply for limited Medicare benefits, become eligible for Medicaid, a different program, qualify for veterans aid and attendance benefits. Let me see what the next slide is. Okay, so let me just talk. So obviously you can use your own money, uh, some people have long-term care insurance, uh, uh, you know, nationwide, it's a relatively small number, uh, have that. If you, if you have that, then that can be a great assistance in uh, peace of mind. And if you actually end up needing nursing home care, well, that can be a huge help to you and to your family. Uh, apply for Medicare benefits. Now, this is a big point of confusion. People who are over 65 are the ones that are most likely to go to a nursing home, right? And, the, and people over 65 have Medicare. And Medicare pays, 80, pays for doctors and hospitals. But it doesn't pay for nursing home care, custodial nursing home care. But people are confused about this. First, the children of elderly folks think that since mom or dad have Medicare, it will cover it. They're, they're, not, they're not clear that that's, that's not something that, that nursing home care is not covered by Medicare. So that's one of the places where people are confused about this. The other point is that Medicare does cover nursing home care just enough to confuse everybody. And so what is the confusion? The confusion is that after someone breaks a hip or has a stroke and they're, they're discharged to a continuing care facility or nursing home and, and for rehab, 
Well, rehab is part of the doctors and hospitals business. Medicare will cover for re cover rehab and pay for the custodial care connected to it. But when when grandmother's rehab stops or she stops improving, when Medicare stops, if mom if if grandmother can't go home, then the cost of nursing home is private pay at that point. And so that's where you get into that sixty three hundred dollars a month business or um, $5,500 a month, whatever it was, or $63,000 a year or whatever it costs at the particular uh, facility. Uh, so that's where, where Medicaid is the program that will potentially cover that. And then there's aid, there's the veterans aid and attendance. So for people who've served on active duty during wartime periods, and for the most part, that means anybody who served on active duty since World War II, since we have a lot of wartime periods. Now, they don't have to be in the war, it just has to be during a wartime period they served on active duty. And they're over 65. And they can show the VA that with the, with the, the income they have, they don't have enough money to pay for in-home care, the amount of in-home care they're going to need, or for, nurse, uh, for uh, assisted living. Um, then, then uh, VA will pay an allowance of between $1,000 and $2,200. Also, the widow of a uh, eligible veteran uh, can also uh, qualify for this benefit. Okay, so uh, this can be helpful for some people. It is not very helpful in the case of nursing home care because that $1,000 to $2,000 isn't enough to cover the higher cost of nursing home care. So then it's, it's Medicaid that's more desirable. Okay, continuing this, um, the problem with Medicaid is that at first blush, those rules say you have to be flat broke to qualify for Medicaid. The, the, the basic rules say that you can't have more than $2,000 in countable resources, more than two, that's like $2,000 in the bank. If you have more than $2,001 yeah, $2, in the bank, you don't qualify. Um, and then it says uh, uh, your, your, uh, your assets, uh, your income has to be under about $2,300. And if it's over $2,300, you don't qualify. Well, so many people just like, well, is it, you'd have to, you know, it's just not feasible for anybody that has any resources whatsoever. But the fact is that many middle-class people can qualify for Medicaid. And the, the problem with the whole, the, the program is that it is so fact specific you have to have a lot of detail and you need somebody to analyze it for you to figure out how to deal with the situation. So just to get a, a, a glimpse of this, we have Ralph and Ruth and Ralph and Ruth live right down the street from Bill and Mary. And they've known each other because uh, the two families have known each other because they moved into the, the same subdivision about the same time and their kids were about the same age. So they're always going back and forth between each other's house. So, um, uh, Ralph uh, retired uh, uh, a couple of years before Bill, and when he retired, his nest egg wasn't as, as big. He had about a quarter of a million dollars in his nest egg. He had some debt. He, they, they had their home, and uh, but they were pretty happy about it, too, about retiring. Uh, but that year he retired, Ruth started, she started to uh, miss names and not remember people and it was, it was like, oh, something's a little bit wrong, but you know, it's, well, we're getting older, so it's no big deal. But this steadily worsened. And so this was the, this is the early onset version of Alzheimer's or dementia. And so every month it got worse. So, you know, in, in, in one month, she's having trouble finding things around the house that she put away. And then she goes to the grocery store and she can't find her, her car in the parking lot or she begins to come home and she can't remember which way to turn. And then coupled with this is this, uh, there's a, in many cases, there's a lot of agitation. And so now she was, uh, she seemed agitated. Uh, she would wake up in the middle of the night and go out of the house and get lost. And so poor Ralph was trying to take care of her at home, but it was just, he was just being run ragged. Also, uh, if you have someone who looks okay, but got not, not too much going on upstairs, this is one of the worst case situations because the people like that can get in all kinds of trouble and they're, e they're very gullible in many cases. So they can, they can, create, huge, they can create big financial problems for, for the family. So it's really heartbreaking. 
any rate, poor old Ralph, after a while, he just, lose, he just he couldn't manage this by himself. So he found a nursing home nearby where he could visit her, and it had one of those, uh, it was for memory care, and it had alarms and stuff uh, to keep her from straying off out of the facility. Anyway, it was a terrible time, and, uh, and so Ralph began paying for the nursing home care from his nest egg. And so she was there 37 months until she passed away. And during that time, he spent uh, all of his savings and uh, just running the math on just the nursing home part of it. You can see at $5,500 a month for 37 months, that's $194,000. And that he had some credit card debt and so forth. And so at the end of the day, he filed for bankruptcy and uh, got rid of the credit card. So he's left with his house and Social Security. So poor Ralph has, has lost his, his sweet Ruth, and then he's got a, a potentially a long period of retirement ahead, and his nest egg's gone. So what a, a sad situation. Now, what did Ralph do wrong? Well, the, what he did wrong is he didn't get any advice. Specifically, he should have gone and talked to us, because this is, we've helped hundreds of families with this kind of situation. Now, usually we're not, the, the, the early onset Alzheimer's is, is thankfully re fairly rare, but uh, dementia or Alzheimer's for people in their 80s and 90s is normal, okay? And so these problems come to families all the time. And, and so the family's worried about taking care of mom or dad or, bro or elderly brother. Uh, and at the same time, they're worrying about who's going to pay for it and how long the nest egg that they have is going to last and all these issues. And so it's tremendously stressful. Well, if Ralph had come to us, we would have, we would have analyzed the situation, set up a plan. He would have known right off the bat how fast uh, uh, we would be able to qualify Ruth for Medicaid. He would have been able to save his nest egg and he could have, uh, he could have uh, avoided that part of the worry as he watched his life savings drain away trying to keep, keep, take care of Ruth. So if you, have, if you have friends or relatives or your own situation, you know that you're in a situation where it's, it, that there's a danger or it's imminent that someone needs nursing. Perhaps they're already, they're already in rehab. Uh, you need to encourage those people to set up an appointment and come talk to us. We are, we're one of the few firms in Houston that offers a free initial consultation for this. Uh, we ask that the client or the responsible party bring in a lot of information. Like I said, this is very fact specific. And so we have to get a lot of facts in order to analyze the situation and figure out the best way to help the client. This is not in any way a do-it-yourself project. Uh, the family needs to come talk to us and we can eliminate a lot of worries and save a lot of money if people will come on time. Ralph missed the boat. Okay, planning mistake number three. It might be Chris's turn to talk about another level of trouble here. All righty. So let's say in our example with Bill and Mary that Bill has passed away. And so Mary is not out of the woods by any means and neither is the estate. So one of the main reasons for that, and this is a major concern that we see a lot of times is that there's no remarriage protection in their will. So if the surviving spouse ends up getting remarried or cohabitating or even just having a long-term care provider in there in the home with them, there's likelihood that the assets are going to go awry and not go to the kids as they were originally intended when Bill set up his will. And so, uh, you know, I'm familiar, a lot of people say I'm never going to get remarried after my spouse passes. Well, I've known situations where that was not true. Uh, my dad, for example, got remarried almost immediately. Uh, uh, it, within a year of my uh, stepmom dying. And I didn't think he would ever get remarried, but uh, typically what tends to happen is, you know, loneliness sets in and there's uh, just a human need for, for companionship. And so these things do happen. And uh, again, a late 
seasoned marriage can really send an estate plan completely in a different direction. So we want to be able to take steps for that. Now there is some good news. So the surviving spouse has an average life expectancy of seven years uh, after their spouse passes away. Well, wait a minute, Chris. I always, the way I always say this is, you know, my wife and I have been married a long time. And uh, I just figure if, if I passed away, my sweetheart, she'd just die the next day or maybe the next week, just by a broken heart. And if, you really, if you've been married a long time, you can't even imagine that one would actually go on after the other, right? Or, um, and, and of course, the other aspect of it is this is, if you've been married a long time, this is not something you can bring up and discuss with your spouse. Oh, honey, yeah, after you're gone, I'm going to, you just can't have that, that conversation. But here we're today, we need to talk to you uh, about this. And so as Chris is about to point out, uh, even though we might think we're going to pass away together, the odds are, as this slide says, one spouse is going to outlive the other by seven years. And there's, I mean, there's still a lot of truth to that, that those first, that first year is going to be tough for the surviving spouse. So uh, the statistics show that if the surviving spouse makes it past those first tough nine months, then their life expectancy is continued, expected to continue for uh, a good while after that. So, all right. Now, planning mistake number four is having to do with the kids. So there's a fear that our beneficiaries are going to be taken advantage of either by divorce or creditors or predators. And so, of course, there's a fear, like we mentioned at the get-go, America has one of the highest divorce rates in the world. And so there is a huge fear that when your children inherit your assets, that if they end up getting a divorce, that there's a chance that the divorcing spouse, so your daughter-in-law or son-in-law, whom you may or may not like, is going to be walking away with at least a sizable portion of that money, if not half. Uh, there's also fear with uh, if there is a lawsuit or let's say the, the inheriting child has significant issues with debt. Well, that's that's a major issue because once they inherit the money, it's just going to go straight to the creditors. And then you got to think about your children's financial maturity. And so the typical estate plan with just a will, a simple will, is going to be divide, dump, and then watch it dissipate. Well, that's not what we want to see happen. You got to ask yourself, you know, if it's a, let's say $750,000 and it's going to the kids, that's a lot of money going into their laps at one time. And it's just, they're not going to treat that money most likely with the same respect that you treat it with, because it's just human nature. If you get money, it's easier to, to spend it than it is to, if it was your own hard earned money. And so it, it really does happen. These estates typically don't last too long if they're just dumped on a child's lap. And some people are more financially mature than others. So you got to ask yourself those questions. And then, so we talked earlier about uh, Susan, you know, she was the good daughter. She did everything right. She got a CPA degree from or, uh, accounting degree from Baylor and she had two beautiful little kids, but she made one big mistake. And this is him right here. This is Jason, Susan's no good husband. And Bill and Mary always tolerated Jason because, well, he was the father of their two grandkids whom they loved very much. And they thought, you know, we can deal with him. They didn't want to mess with any of the relationship. Well, he couldn't hold down a job. He always had a drinking problem and a <clears throat> a couple of years after Bill and Mary or Bill and Mary pass away and Susan inherits that money, she finally gets wise and realizes I've had enough of this Jason guy. I, it's time to leave him. This is way overdue. Well, this is the last thing Bill and Mary would want to see is Jason walking away with a good portion of that money that they left for their daughter and for their grandkids. And so there's a typical desire amongst families to keep the money in their bloodline so that if their kids do get divorced, the money doesn't go with the divorcing spouse. It all stays in their bloodline. 
And then another concern. So we talked about John earlier. Now John just couldn't seem to get things right. Couldn't get his life in order. Well, what do you think the first thing a guy like that's going to do when he inherits a large sum of money? A young male. It's almost genetically ingrained in us. Well, it's, it's going to be to buy that shiny red sports car there in the back. And, and he is so proud of that sports car. He li likes to drive it fast, show it off. And what do you think is going to happen to John? Well, some of you might be saying, well, yeah, he's going to get in a car accident. He's going to hurt somebody. Well, sure, that, that might be true eventually. But that's not his first problem. You know, Bob mentioned earlier that John had a casual attitude towards paying his taxes. Well, as soon as John inherits that money, the IRS has every right to get in there and pull it right out and, and take it as their own. And so uh, that's the big concern and we could protect against that. And that's really the sad part with a lot of these simple estate plans is that they just don't account for issues like this and they don't protect. And then we've got our lawsuit expenses. So if, let's say this, if either Mary or even one of the children were driving down the road and they reach down to pick up their coffee, you know, it's hot, so you gotta do it carefully. And in that moment of looking down, ends up, let's say, hitting a school bus, worst case example. That's a terrible scenario. And if the damages from that lawsuit resulting from that crash are greater than the liability insurance that you have, well, the state is exposed at that point, but we can protect the estate. We can protect it from lawsuits and other creditors of that nature. It just has to be done appropriately. And your typical will will not do that. So as you can see, there's a lot of ways that you can protect your family that just aren't in a typical estate plan. Now, planning mistake number five has to do with uh, the retirement plan protections. So this is a real common issue that we see is that, so a, uh, an, a retirement plan, so let's say your 401k or your IRA, it has to have the proper beneficiary designations on it. You know, too, too many times these things are set up many years in the past and, and there's perhaps an assumption or wishful thinking that those designations are correct. Well, that's not how you should operate. We need to make very certain that all of the aspects of the assets are gonna flow the way that they should flow. So the retirement plan being another one, because it's not gonna be probate property and it's not going to be owned by a trust. We can have it flow through the trust once it's going to the children. And, and there's a lot of benefits to that, but we have to make sure that the beneficiary designations are set up correctly. And one major reason for that is uh, just right up there with the home, typically at retirement accounts are some of the biggest assets that we own here as Texans. And so we see many families where a lot of their assets are held in the IRA or 401k, and, and we need to make sure that those assets flow the way they should. All right, planning mistake number six. This is your do-it-yourself and bare bones trust. You know, it's interesting. So I heard a commercial for LegalZoom for estate planning on my way here to work this morning on CNBC. Well, there, that's exactly the kind of thing I was saying at the beginning can be a real issue. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And we'll talk about that. But here's one of the biggest ones. LegalZoom isn't really going to care that this thing works for you through time. They're really what we'd call a document peddler. They're not looking to develop a long-term relationship and see that this plan works for you, for your children, uh, for your surviving spouse, and even on to generations beyond that. But that's what we do is we really do care about these relationships and that's where our value is. And so no fun, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a secret is that a, a lot of trusts fail because they weren't properly funded. So let's say you did get your trust free online or at a, a notary store or a legal zoom. Well, there's a good chance they're not going to go through the steps with you to make sure that you get that thing properly funded. Because if you don't put your assets in the name of the trust, 
Well, then the trust doesn't really have any power. It only has power over the assets it owns. And that's how we avoid probate. Uh, additionally is timely updates. Again, we said that we want this to work for you and your family. Every once in a while, you're gonna have to look at your planning and make sure that it's up to date with either changes in the law, or changes in your personal circumstances. You know, there might be births or divorces or just a, a change in heart and really who you want to receive your assets. Uh, you know, we've talked about probate here, but if you have a will, you're pretty much guaranteed to be going to probate court. And so uh, there's a good way of avoiding that with a revocable living trust, really the legacy wealth planning trust that we've been discussing. Uh, they're not gonna include re remarriage protection or divorce protection or the lawsuit protections. And then finally, the family legacy. Again, you're, when you get these documents online, they're not gonna care about recording your personal stories and things like that. That's what we're here for. And then the last mistake, mistake number seven, is that there's no legacy protection. That's what I was just hinting on, is that there's no plan to pass on family values and lessons that you've learned along the way. Uh, also, there's no way of you know, leaving a legacy for, let's say your church or charities that you wanna support. So we wanna get to know you, know what's important to you, so that we can help you develop a plan that's personal to you, not just an online print off document. And so this is our uh, My Legacy plan, and it's a way of recording all of those personal stories that we were talking about. So that really, a great example is on a tombstone. Typically it just says the date you were born, and then a dash, and then the date you died. Well, we're so much more than just that dash. You know, we're more than just a name on a family tree. What's really important is our contributions that we've made to the family. Uh, how we were a steward of the family and the challenges and successes that we've seen in our lifetimes. All of that is extremely important to pass down because those memories will get lost over time as generation over generation goes through. And so let's summarize what an ineffective plan this has been thus far for Bill and Mary got a simple will set up. First of all, it did not provide protection from uh, living or a death probate. So again, a will is only effective after death. So it doesn't have any disability planning and it's going to most likely guarantee a probate. There was no nursing home cost protection, no remarriage protection, no lawsuit, creditor or divorce protections for the kids. There was no retirement plan uh, protection and evaluation. There was also you know, you're not gonna get the same level of protection with a do-it-yourself or bare bones, bare bones plan. And, and this could be even, a, not just online documents, but there's a lot of attorneys out there that promote cheap documents. You know, if they're promoting how cheap it is, probably not that good of a document and, and not that good of a relationship that they're hoping to establish with you. And then lastly, number seven, is that there was no way to preserve Bill and Mary's wisdom, their stories, their family life lessons. And uh, that's a real tragedy, but all of that can get lost. So you can tell that Bill and Mary, they thought that they were protected because they had a simple will. And, and this is true of many Americans. And it's really a sad thing because they weren't as protected as they could have been. And the family has had to jump through hoops and hurdles the entire way through. And, and there could be a better way. All right. Bob, would you like to take us from here? Well, sure. Okay, so uh, so you've been uh, uh, listening to what we've been talking about and watching the slides. And so you're here because you want to deal with these issues and you want to take care of, of your family. And so that's a, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't take care, don't, are not willing to give it enough time or consideration and you are doing that. So uh, you're trying to take care of your family. That's why you're doing this. So why, is, why do we do what we do? And so, as I mentioned before, as, as time has gone by, we, I've taken this to be my calling. 
uh, that there's just no better work than to be able to help people uh, protect their, their families. Now, this has never been a one-man show, and it can't be a one-man show. And so one of the things that, that I tried to do and we want to continue into the future is we want people on our staff that share that vision that we are doing great work for our clients, we're doing important work for our clients, and we want them to have successful results for their family. So that's why. And the how is that we want to have a staff where we have uh, people that are knowledgeable and experienced who can help our clients. So Stephanie's been working with me since 1996. Kathy's been working with me since 2000. Mary's been here since uh, for seven years, I think, seven or eight years. Aless, who's our uh, Medicaid expert, has worked with me for, I don't know, nine or 10 years. So uh, we, we're about continuity, we're about relationships, and we're about trying to help our clients have a successful estate planning experience that protects the family the way they they want and so when we when we meet people and we work with people our our goal is to it's not just to deliver this one-time uh, uh, project but that um, uh, what we want to be have the privilege of being your trusted advisor for your family out into the future and what I what I've been saying to people and, it, and I, I believe it absolutely you know I know all about estate planning but if I had a stroke or passed away, my wife doesn't, my children don't. And so my wife would need advice and assistance with that. And so what we wanna do is, uh, you know, she would come back here and be able to meet with people who care about the success of her, of our planning and who, are in, who wanna give her consistent advice with uh, what uh, uh, she's, she's built into her planning already. And if something happens to my wife and I, then my, my children would need that same kind of assistance. So this really is a, a situation where uh, your family's gonna be a lot more, you're gonna be a lot more comfortable and your family's gonna be a lot more comfortable if you're comfortable initially with us and you sort of share our vision that we need to go along through the future here and take care of these issues together. Okay, so if we're gonna actually deal with this and, and uh, get this, the procrastination monster off of this project, so you either uh, get your estate planning done or if there's uh, things that you feel like you need to amend or restate your, your documents, uh, then how can we move to action? So first thing, uh, just to, to give people who are doing the planning, you say, well, okay, you've been talking about all these documents. What is it we get? What, what are we trying to, to have as, uh, uh, to do all this? And so we're gonna provide you with, uh, with a big notebook, our portfolio. And if you're doing trust-based planning, then you're gonna have your family wealth trust, that's your revocable living trust. It may have sub-trust to protect your spouse or to protect uh, you if you were the surviving spouse or to protect your children from uh, uh, future divorces or for asset protection and so forth. And then we've been, then if you have living trust planning, you're also gonna have a will. That's sort of counterintuitive because you say, wait a minute, I thought we didn't want to do probate. The problem is if something's left out of the trust, then you, you, you still need a will. And they're called pour over wills because they only want to have one provision in them really. It just says, if you find any probate property out there, put it in my trust. But you have, you, remember, you got to go through probate if that happens. So our goal is not to use that, that will, but you're, it's there in case it's necessary. And then you need to have a statutory durable power of attorney. They're also called property or financial powers of attorney. Uh, you also need to have healthcare documents and you're going to have a, a standalone HIPAA authorization. That's the last one there. And that's uh, uh, to deal with um, medical records and so forth. So you're going to have this great big, this collection of important documents to deal with the things you and your family care about. In addition to that, then we're going to assist you in funding your trust and in updating your beneficiary designation. So there's a lot of work that goes into this project. Now, when the documents are actually delivered, the first thing that's gonna happen on the delivery day is you're gonna come in and sit down and watch a video. 
And this video is about your estate plan. It gives an overview of all the documents that you have in there, as well as specifics on who your trustees, who your agents are, who your executors are, and so forth. And so uh, this video then, when, when we're finished with it, we're gonna give it to you on a flash drive along with signed copies of all your documents. So you're gonna end up with the originals of your documents and then a flash drive with, with signed copies of your documents on it and this video. Now, uh, for years and years, Stephanie and I delivered all the trust personally, but it's so much information to give somebody, some family, some couple over, you know, it's, it's like three hours of delivery process and there's just so much information that it's hard for people to remember it. So this video is, it seems like the, the, the best mousetrap, the better way to deal with this, because now you can take that home and in the future, when you need a refresher, you can watch that. Or if you want to talk to your son or daughter who's going to be your successor trustee about your estate planning, you can sit down and watch that on your TV. And so this is a way to, to keep this fresh enough so that you feel comfortable with your planning and you know what it's about. Um, and so, um, as far as I know, we're the only law firm in Houston that's doing this. This is, again, this is a function of the American Academy of Estate Planning Attorneys uh, made this available to their uh, law firms and we uh, seized the opportunity to use it. And so, um, to me, this is a big advantage of doing business with us. This one thing is huge. Now, when, when you're thinking about estate planning, of course, we're all interested in bargains, but some things don't seem as like as good a choice for bargains, right? Um, if we're gonna, you know, you know, buy gasoline or um, buy food or whatever, in many cases, uh, things are commodities. But uh, this slide says maybe you not, not, we wouldn't be so interested in bargains if we were talking about parachutes. Uh, it says brain surgery, but any surgery probably. But then it's got fire extinguishers on there. And uh, so uh, fire extinguishers are analogy, a good analogy to estate planning. Most things that you buy, well, you can take them back to the store if they don't work. But things like surgery or parachutes or fire extinguishers, when you buy that fire extinguisher and you put it in your shop or your boat, you're just hoping that when the day comes and the fire breaks out, that that thing works. And that's what you're, you, you want that estate planning. And so this means we need to be careful and diligent in setting this up. And we need your help as well as, as all part of that process so that we can have peace of mind that we have a, a good system. It addresses the situation in your family that you're interested in and it's gonna work when it's called upon. So you say, well, how much does this cost? So our, our, uh, our living trust planning, we call it this, the gold category here, Revocable Living Trust, which includes all the documents that I was talking about. It includes the uh, deeding your home into the trust. It includes um, uh, providing paperwork and coordination to retitle your assets into the trust. And it includes assistance in updating your beneficiary designations. That's all included. The cost is $47.95. So if you're a married couple, the cost is $47.95. And if you're a single person, the cost is $47.95. Uh, sometimes there are additional costs involved. If there are additional costs, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, be, we'll talk about that during the initial consultation and we'll figure out what it is and give you a flat fee. So an example of an additional cost would be if you have another house, well, we're gonna charge you for that extra deed. Number one deed's included, the deed on your home's included, but if you have another house, then there's going to be a charge for that deed. If you have an LLC or a partnership or something, we have to put those interests in the trust, there's going to be an extra charge, but we'll tell you what that is on the front end. Uh, this process takes, uh, it takes a, uh, a month typically from the time you say go to us until we do the delivery. And then once uh, we do the delivery, usually there's another follow-on meeting when we do some of those funding actions, the deed to your home, letters to your accounts and so forth. And then you're gonna have to follow up and make sure that those accounts and that uh, gets, uh, those accounts get retitled, beneficiaries get updated. Okay, so there's, there's work and diligence and effort from us and from you to get to, to do a good job on this. Now, we recognize that some people 
don't or do not want to spend forty seven ninety five or they feel like their own planning just isn't that complicated so for for uh, a, a very so for some clients uh, we also do basic will planning now when we say a will package though it's not just a will remember that was what the problem with Mary Bill and Mary had they just had a will well, our will will be more tailored to what the client's need is, and it will also include the financial power of attorney, the medical power of attorney, the HIPAA authorization, and it will include uh, a, uh, a letter about uh, how to set up your beneficiary uh, designations. And the cost of this for a single person starts at about $1,000 for the will package, and for a married couple, it starts at about $1,500. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea about those two things. Now, don't forget what I said earlier. If you have a loved one or a neighbor and you, and, and you know that they're facing nursing home or they may go be going into a nursing home, uh, that the, the people that are trying to care for them need to come see us. Uh, we can do, uh, uh, for many of these clients, we can provide them with peace of mind, save them tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and so they need to come talk to us before they just start paying until they're broke. All right, Chris. All right. What about this? <laughs> well, you know, it's humorous. Uh, so don't get caught with your head stuck in the sand. And as humorous as this picture is, there's a story that goes along with this. And this is, uh, so every year, twice a year, we go to summits uh, all across America where with the American Academy, we can meet with our colleagues and really learn more about different practices so that we can get the best practices that there are. Well, we learned of a story that was real sad, and this was about a year ago at one of these summits, where he said that he got a call from a lady, she said that her mom just passed away, and she couldn't find the estate planning documents and hoped that they, the law firm had the originals or at least a copy. Well, they checked their, their records. They didn't have any documents. What they found was the mom had set up an appointment, but had canceled it the day of. And so she never came in to set up her documents. Now the daughter was going to have to go through an, an expensive probate without a will being in place. So a, a probate without a will is a lot more expensive than a probate with a will. That's why we always encourage everybody to have a will at the very least. Well, so that daughter was out of luck and the mom was just one day away from having her planning put in place that would have a great impact on her daughter, but she decided to cancel the appointment Well, and then never got around to it. So don't let that happen to you. If it's time to take action and you're ready to make a commitment to take action, then we encourage you to follow through with that and, and actually see this thing through. Now there's a great quote by Pablo Picasso it says only put off until tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. So you got to ask yourself, is this the kind of duty that you are willing to die having left undone? Are you willing to leave a mess for your kids and your, your spouse to clean up when you're not here anymore and you're not able to handle these issues on your, on your own? Of course not. You want to take action. Nobody wants to be remembered for having left a mess. And so how do we take action? Well, the first step is going to be giving us a call. So our consultations are free and there's no, no catch to that. It's a free consultation. And so if you give us a call, we'll be able to get you scheduled. Uh, these appointments do fill up fairly quickly. So we encourage you to call and get something on the books as quickly as possible. Well, and also if you're concerned about the, the, uh, coronavirus, we can, we can use, uh, uh, we could use uh, Zoom meetings mm -hmm. as a way of meeting with you initially, and uh, it allows us to share documents and talk about stuff. So uh, it, it opens up another avenue if you, you still feel like you don't want to get out and uh, risk getting sick. That's a great point, Bob. So we are doing in-office consultations now that things are opening up a bit. And we're keeping those at least somewhat limited or staggered so that we don't have a bunch of people in the office at one time. 
but a, a Zoom meeting or a Skype meeting, either one of those would work just fine, or even a phone consultation. You would prefer to see each other just to have that close relationship because that's what we're wanting to develop. But uh, we're willing to accommodate to whatever is best for you. But you, please give us a call and we'll be able to set that up for you. And just let us know at that point in time which type of medium you would like the consultation to be through. Now we know that we talked about bargains earlier and estate planning is not the place for a bargain, but everybody still loves a bargain. And we appreciate that you guys were willing to sit here and, and watch this presentation today and learn more about how estate planning can impact you and your family. So what we're willing to do is provide a, an educational credit for $250 off of a new trust or 5% off all other sorts of planning. Now to receive your certificate, we ask a couple of things. Uh, first, that the appointment be scheduled so that you call, give us a call within the next two weeks to schedule your appointment. That's because, you know, when is something, when is it a good time to take action? When you're first learning about and most aware of the issues. We're trying to encourage you to get away from that procrastination monster by exactly. offering you this incentive to do something in the next two weeks. Yes. And, and just think about it, when would be the best time to talk about this after you've seen the seminar? Wait six months and then talk about it? No, obviously it'd be better to talk, talk to us after, you know, when this is fresh on your mind and you've yeah. been thinking about this. Best for you and best for us too. That's right. Uh, additionally, if you're married, we do ask that both spouses attend the meeting. Now, we know sometimes one spouse handles uh, financial issues more than the other, but we have found that these meetings go much more efficiently if both spouses are there. And there's good reason for that is, like I said, we're not just talking about finances. We want to get to know both of you and know how everything should work together because it's not all just about money. And then lastly, we ask that at the end of the meeting, so the beginning of the meeting, I'm going to uh, ask some specific questions or Bob's going to ask some specific questions. That way we have a good understanding of the situation. And then you'll have your opportunity to ask questions and we'll work together to build a plan that works for you. Now, once we've accomplished this, what we're going to do is ask a simple question. Are you ready to proceed with us today or not? And, and so all that we ask is to receive your certificate. You give us a clear yes or no answer. Now that yes or no answer is very important because it lets us know if this is something that's still on your to-do list or if it's something that we need to take action on and get going for you. And so the one answer you'll notice wasn't there was a maybe. And, but the, and, that, and why is that? Because the procrastination monster loves the word maybe or the words, I want to think about it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you shouldn't feel bashed by saying no. If you don't feel like this is the right fit for you after having a con consultation, then that's totally fine. This is a business of relationships. We're going to be better off for having gotten to know you, and you're going to be better off for having learned more about your estate planning. But that's what's required to get your $250 off of a new trust or 5% off of any other planning documents. All right. So one last question, and I guess I can't really ask this because it'd be hard for you to respond, but I sure hope that it was worth you guys coming today and spending this, what, hour and a half or so with us to learn more about estate planning, how it can affect your family, how you can improve a plan that you already have, and uh, a, having a call to action. And That's, it's and the great opportunity to uh, protect your spouse or yourself and your, your children. So that's the, that's the other, the big advantage side of estate planning. It's such an opportunity mm -hmm. to provide additional protection for your estate. Yeah. A lot of people think of estate planning as, well, uh, that's going to be a burden. Well, and avoiding a problem, just avoiding yeah. a problem. But it's also this opportunity to safeguard and protect as well. Absolutely.